Hello, everybody. This is Sarah Szymanski with the Mount Airy branch of the Carroll County Public Library. And I'm here with Emily Zobel from the University of Maryland Extension. And she is going to tell us all about this cicada invasion that we are in the middle of. Emily, I'm going to send it on to you. Awesome. So thanks so much for having me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let me see if I can get this. Ooh, hang on. Let me do that. And let me share that. Oh. Let's see. Are you seeing the screen now, Sarah? Hopefully you guys are seeing and I'm not hearing anything. So hopefully you guys can see it. Um, so again, my name is Emily Zobel and I work for the University of Maryland Extension and I have a background in entomology. So today I'm gonna to talk about the 17 year cicadas or the Great Eastern Brood, which is brood 10, which is the one that's happening right now. So one of the main things that we always get people asking about is how is this different from our normal cicadas that come out every single year? So brood 10 is the ones that we are seeing right now, which would be these ones off to the left side. So these red-eyed, black, orange-winged versions versus our annual or our dog day cicadas are these ones that are here on the right side. So these are kind of green and black. They are a little bit more robust. These guys are... Our dog days are really good flyers. The brood tens are sort of not, but basically um, brood 10 comes out every 17 years. It's like a mass emergence versus our dog days. You're gonna have some that come out every single year and they tend to come out later in the summer. So these dog days ones are the ones that you start hearing and seeing in like July through in August versus the uh, periodical cicadas tend to come out early in the spring. So the periodical ones are the ones that you're finding now. So brood 10 is what we are currently in the middle of right now. And again, these are 17 year cicadas. So the last time that these guys were out was 2004. Um, they are not the same cicadas. So the ones in 2004 laid eggs, those eggs hatched, those ones went down into the ground and those ones died and we have brand new cicadas. But again, they're on a 17 year cycle. Um, brood 10 is actually made up of three different species of cicadas, which are the three that are listed here. So cicadas in general are what we call a true bug, which means that they flee, feed on the xylem and phloem of woody plants. So these guys aren't chewing on leaves or anything like that. They have a sucking, piercing mouth sar. So think of this as they've got a straw that's going to tap into the tree and it's going to suck out that sap. So the nice thing is that they don't harm you, they don't harm your pets, and they're not going to really kill a tree. They're going to do a little bit of feeding and that's about it. What's really amazing about brood 10 is why we have lots of broods of these periodical cicadas. Brood 10 is probably one of the largest ones we have. And you can see across this map just the range that they can be found in. So you're going to find them all across kind of this northeastern area as well as um, over throughout kind of a little bit of the middle bit of the United States. So for their life cycle, we'll just do a little bit more in detail. So we're going to have the adult cicadas, which are out now. What the female is going to do after she mates, she's going to overposition some eggs inside little pencil-sized twigs, which is what you're seeing here at the top of the life cycle. After about a few weeks, the nymphs, which are these little white guys, will hatch out of these eggs, and they will drop down into the soil. They will then, over time, dig down into the soil. So that first year of life, they're gonna hang out in the top few inches of your soil, really feeding on probably your grass roots. And again, they're not chewing on the grass roots. They've got that sucking, piercing mouth part. So they're just gonna tap those grass roots and just steal a little bit of the sugar and the nutrients that your grass is generating. Not enough to harm it. You're not even gonna notice that they're there. And then as they get older and they go through a few more molts, they're gonna go deeper and deeper into the soil. And they'll get anywhere from about 12 to 16 inches down. And then they'll continue feeding on plant roots. By the time they get down that deep, they're normally feeding on tree roots particularly. And they'll just sort of ride it out. And then when 17 years later, they will slowly start coming up to the surface 
And once the soil temperature reaches 64 degrees, they will do a mass emergence, which is what's happening now. So they'll come out as nymphs, which is what you're seeing here down at the bottom of the screen. They will crawl up a surface via a tree or a lamp or a fence post, and then they will crack their exoskeleton open down the back and wiggle on out. They'll hang out and dry out their wings because you can see as they emerge, they're nice and light colored. So they'll hang out, they'll dry out their wings. Then once they're hardened up, they will move further up into the treetops and feed a little bit and then they'll mate and then the whole cycle will repeat over and over again. So now we're gonna go through that same life cycle with a little bit more of a timeline. Um, a lot of these stuff has passed, but you can kind of think like, oh yeah, I saw that or oh no, I didn't see that. So around April is when you start to notice these holes. Um, they're not necessarily emerging yet, but a lot of times they will kind of crawl out to the surface and kind of peek on out. They'll get a feel for it, particularly on those warmer days, but they're not quite ready to come out. Think of it as like, in the morning when you keep hitting the snooze button, like you're sort of ready to get out of bed, but you kind of don't really want to commit to it. Um, they don't want to be the first ones at the party, but they want to necessarily be there when the party starts. So you're going to start noticing these holes in April and you can see the little ones poking out. A lot of times you'll notice this is when like other wildlife will come start to notice them. So birds will start digging them up. Foxes and skunks will start digging them up. Dogs will start digging them up to eat on them. Then around May is when they really start to emerge. So this is when they're kind of going to do that grand exit out of the soil. And you can see them here again, emerging and then cracking open that exoskeleton. And then this one right here is the one that's hanging out, drying its wings. So you can see they're actually this really beautiful cream color right at the beginning. And then as they kind of puff up and harden up, they turn to that really nice striking black orange coloration. So after they've hardened up, what they will do is they'll gather on plants and they'll start to sing. Um, and that's probably what you guys are hearing now if you're outside, you hear them singing and their calls will actually be distinct depending on the species and what they're trying to do. So ones that are just kind of calling out versus ones that are doing their mating calls will vary a little bit. But the idea here is because again, you've got those three different species, is you climb up to a tree and you kind of yell out what you are with the hopes that others like you gather together. And these guys basically, their defense mechanism is just this large mass emergence. So when you do that, it's hard to say like who you can mate with and who you can't. So that's why they're up there and they're just calling out they're singing their song. It's a great big um, pop music boy band in the trees. So what will basically happen is your males are going to call out and then your females will approach them and he'll change his call. And if she likes it, she'll flick her wings a few times and that'll signal that it's okay to mate, which is what you're seeing down here at the bottom. So then they're going to mate and then the female will again go over position. So this little black line right here off this one in the right corner is her over positioner. And she will find about pencil wide twigs and trees and she'll just jab her over positioner in there and she'll lay you know, 20 some odd eggs and she'll just slowly go down a line laying them. And then she'll go find someone to mate with again until she eventually dies of old age or she gets eaten or what have you. So all this is still continuing um, right now in June, and this will continue for the next week or so, depending on the weather and stuff. Um, and then you're slowly going to start to see these guys dying off. Um, what you will notice is the damage, however, that is happening. So again, them feeding doesn't really cause them damage, but this female doing her over positioning will cause a little bit of damage. I mean, what happens is what we call flagging damage. So you can see that in the picture here with the tree, um, which is this little browning of the tip. So through her doing her over positioning, she basically has broken down the vascular tissue in that stem of that tree. So the leaves will basically die back. And this is really easy to prune out. If you have a large, well-established tree, this isn't going to harm it. This isn't even going to stunt it. It's mildly unsightly, but you can easily prune it out. And then come July, um, that flagging damage is still going to be seen. And what's going to happen in July is that 
this is when those eggs are going to hatch and those nymphs are going to fall down into the soil and they're going to dig on down. And that's when they're going to just hang out there until 17 years later and they'll come up. So yeah, and this will continue to happen throughout August. Um, and then again, at the beginning of August, however, is when our dog day cicadas start to show up. So it might seem really weird that like the periodicals drop off in kind of June, early July, and then our normal dog way ones will pick back up in August. So this year you kind of get all the cicadas all spring and summer long. So these guys basically do this mass emergence as their defense mechanism. So unlike our dog days, which come out every single year and are pretty good flyers and are really good at kind of evading predators, these guys are not. I mean, if you're literally in the ground for 17 years and then you come up and you start yelling and screaming and singing up in the treetops, you're pretty much telling your predators exactly where you are. So in order to combat that, they just have to outnumber the predators. So there just have to be too many of them for their predators to eat. So that's why you're kind of seeing all of these mass numbers of them. Is this is their defense mechanism. So you're going to see things like birds eating them. You're going to see, you know, possums and foxes and squirrels eating them. If you happen to live near a waterway and they fall in the water, fish will eat them. Um, we can actually eat them. Um, we have a, at the University of Maryland has the Cicada Crew website and they actually have a recipe book where you in fact can cook and eat these guys. I actually recommend if you're gonna eat them, eating the nymphs is probably the best life cycle part to eat. Um, and you've kind of missed the opportunity to do that at this point, but you can eat the adults. I would recommend if you do decide to eat the adults that you probably wanna remove the legs and wings. Um, so the best thing to do is if you wanna eat them is to um, collect some and then always collect the live ones. You don't ever want to eat anything that's dead that you yourself didn't know how it died. So I would collect living ones, wash them off, stick them in a Ziploc bag and pop them in your freezer for a few hours. This will let, give them a nice peaceful death. And then from there you can roast them or you can boil them or you can go about doing whatever you want. I actually really like roasting them and putting Old Bay on them. Um, I've also done some roasted ones with cinnamon sugar, which was actually pretty good. Um, they taste kind of like a nutty corn puff, so pretty good. And if you are grossed out by this, just remember that we pay $30 for lobster, and this is basically the lobster's cousin. So they're really not thing any different than eating seafood. Um, that being said, if you do have a seafood allergy, we would not recommend eating these. I know people's pets also really love to gouge on these, but we would recommend that particularly um, dogs tend to gouge a little bit more than cats. But if you do have a dog, kind of let them feed in moderation because of their chitin exoskeletons. Um, they can cause some kind of congestion issues for dogs if they overindulge in them. So how do they know when to show up? So this is a common question that most people kind of ask, like, how do they know that 17 years are up? Like, do they have, you know, they don't have a smartphone down there to set off a timer. So how do they exactly know? So there's a few different theories on this. We don't know for certain. Um, insects have what we call degree days because they are cold blooded. They rely on warmth to help them in order to move their muscles and to help them grow and develop. So some of the predictions are is that their ability to come up with these 17 years is just based off of temperature alone. And particularly with things like climate change and global warming happening, we may see a shift in how long it takes them to do this because of that. But there's a few other theories in this. One is that they're counting the seasonal changes based off of the nutrition and plant hormones in the xylem and foam that they're feeding on. So remember that these guys are underground. And underground's a little bit more stable though. Like temperature wise, it's a lot more stable under there. So it's not like they're gonna count summer as being like hot and winter as being cold. So they're counting the seasons potentially through the change. And as trees particularly, you know, bloom and then add leaves and then drop leaves, the amount of the sugars and chemicals in their xylem changes. And you can see that in the graph here. So it'll spike in January, it spikes again in May, it spikes kind of in the late summer and it goes back down. So it's possible that they're counting these spikes and or that these spikes in nutrition 
allow them to do some growing and then back down and growing and back down. Another thought is that they have an internal clock that kind of allows them to do this. And we have found that there are some insects that do have internal clocks. There's been some really interesting studies, particularly with honeybees, that show that if you have a honeybee hive in Europe and you put it on a plane and bring it here to the United States, it will have jet lag. So they have an internal clock. So there's a possibility that the 17 years is based off of an internal clock these guys have. But in a short term thing, they know to come out together based on that soil temperature hitting 64 degrees. So 64 degrees and that 17th year is how they know, bam, it's time for, it's time for me to show up at the party. It's time for me to try out for you know, American Idol, it's, it's time for me to join the boy band and the dance group and get up in those trees and sing my heart out and, you know, live my life to the fullest. So the boy band in the trees. So again, they are here. Um, their singing is probably one of the most noticeable things people notice from them. It's probably the most annoying thing that a lot of people also find about them. So they'll typically sing of between 10 a.m. and about 5 p.m. Together as a group, they can get to be about 85 to 100 decibels, which is about comparable to your yard equipment. So think of like how loud like a leaf blower or a lawnmower gets. That's how loud these guys collectively as a group can be. They do have a, a combination of ways that they do make noise. So some of this is wing flicking or wing clicking but the majority of the call that you're actually hearing, so out in um, the kind of loud calls that you're hearing is done through a timbal, which is an organ that's only found on the males. And that is this little silver one that's found right here on the thumb. And what this basically does is it works like a drum. So it's a, a membrane that's kind of stretched across that they can vibrate. And inside of the cavity, it's hollow and that allows it to be amplified. So I'm gonna play the video and we'll see if it, you can see it happening. So you can see it flexing right there. Awesome. And I want to thank Dr. Mike Raup, um, who is a emeritus professor with the entomology department at the University of Maryland um, for letting me use that video. It is up on YouTube as well as on his bug of the week page. So if you want to show it to someone or take a look at it or show it to kids, um, you can easily find it there as well. So again, what does their damage look like? Well, the good thing is, is that cicadas are pretty harmless to us. They're not gonna bite, they don't sting. Um, if you're holding one, you might feel a small prick if it's trying to feed on you, but again, it's not gonna break skin. So these guys are really harmless. They're a little, they're large, and a lot of people are intimidated by that, but they are completely harmless to people, to pets, um, and to well-established trees. Again, they're, they're gonna be perfectly fine. It's that twig size branches that the female's gonna over position in. And this is what it'll look like when she initially does it and then later on after she's done it. So you could easily go through and prune these out now, but I would recommend go ahead and leaving them until probably August. Um, let those, those eggs and those nymphs have the opportunity to hatch out so that we get to have this phenomenon again in 17 years. But again, if your tree looks something like this, you can easily prune this out yourself or you can call an arborist or a company to come prune them out. I would recommend if you do go with a landscaping company, make sure that they are trained and are professional so that they don't just come through and hack it out. You really just need to prune out the flagging bits. Um, it's a little too late to do this at this point because the cicadas are out already and have probably already started laying eggs. But if you did happen to have any small plants that you didn't want cicadas laying eggs on, the best thing to do to prevent them is to use netting. Um, because of the size of these guys and their mobility, chemicals are just not effective. And you're gonna end up doing a lot more environmental damage if you decide to control them with chemicals than if you did with a netting. And then netting them is pretty easy to do. But again, at this point, 
Uh, if you've already got them on your plants, it, it's it's not really worth the time and the energy to to do this. But for next time they come out, so 17 years from now, if you do have some young plants that need protecting, you can get some netting. But again, any sort of well-established tree will be a-okay. Even young trees that have that flagging, it might stunt them for a year or two. But if you go ahead and make sure that the soil is healthy and that they're getting plenty of water next year, they'll easily outgrow any and all of the damage. So this is a really amazing phenomenon that happens. So we are encouraging everyone in the public to get involved with this. Like this is a great thing to go out and explore with kids. Um, this is a great opportunity to get up and see bugs up and close, particularly these are harmless ones. So one of the really nice things that we was done was the creation of this, which is the Cicada Safari app. And you can download this for free. And as you find cicadas, you can snap pictures of them and it will geotag them. And then all of this information gets composited here and other scientists can then look at this and can help predict how many are around, where they're emerging, where they're not emerging. And we can really kind of track these guys. Cause unfortunately people always ask, well, you know, why are they here? Why are they not there? And a lot of times we don't know, we've got some data from these, but a lot of our data is sort of, off or it was based on like citizen scientists like this. So we're asking people to kind of engage with this um, because this really is a natural phenomenon that really only happens here in the United States as well as there's like a small pocket of them down in South America, but this is the largest brood and it's happening now and it's pretty cool. So if you guys have any questions, um, you can feel free to type them into the chat and I'm happy to answer them. I would also recommend checking out the University of Maryland Extension Cicada Crew website, um, which you can see the URL there. This was done by a bunch of grad students in the entomology department and they have some really great videos as well as some really great facts, um, questions and answers that are really common. Mike Raup also has his bug of the week and he's been doing multiple updates about these cicadas from when they initially emerged all the way through, as well as my email address is there as well. So if you have any questions about the cicadas um, that weren't able to get answered now, feel free to shoot me an email and I will be happy to kind of respond back. Uh, we'll go ahead and stop sharing. All right, thank you so much, Emily. That was amazing. Um, I do have one question. Let me pop it up on the screen here. It's from Melinda from Facebook. I haven't seen any cicada killers wasps yet. Do they come out later in the summer for the periodic? So the cicada killer wasps do come out later in the summer, but they actually don't come out for the periodic cicadas at all. Because remember, those periodical cicadas only come out every 13 or 17 years, depending on the brood. Cicada wasps die out every single year. So they're not going to like whisper to the egg they lay, like, remind your great, 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 great grandkids to come out early this one year for these. They're, they're coming out every single year for those dog day cicadas. So they actually don't care about the periodicals at all. Um, if there are some late periodicals that are out when they start emerging, they'll definitely take them but their main focus is the dog day cicadas. But that's a great question. I've gotten that asked by multiple Google being like, I haven't seen any cicada killers out yet, even though there's all these cicadas. And it's like, well, they kind of work on different cycles. If they only knew to get up a little early, that there was this feast happening, I'm sure they would be happy to. They just don't know. Nobody invited them to the party, unfortunately. Well, I have a, well, I have a question. Um, here in Carroll County, we don't really see many of them. Um, and I know that, especially where, like in the Westminster area, Northern area, we don't see a lot of them, maybe a little bit in Eldersburg, definitely going towards Howard County, Baltimore County. Is there a reason for that? So there could be multiple reasons for that. Um, so like I live on the Eastern shore of Maryland and we don't have them here at all. Um, and there are very dependent on kind of certain environmental situations. So again, remember that they're living underground for 17 years. So if you live in an area that has been developed a lot and that soil has been disturbed rather greatly, 
sometime between now and 17 years ago, so 2004, the likelihood of them surviving that decreases. You might also have soil that's just not their ideal soil. We have really sandy soils here on the Eastern shore and for the most part, they don't seem to really like that. So it could be one of the reasons why we don't particularly get him um, over here. If you also live in an area that tends to flood a lot or has a high water table, again, they're living at least a foot underground. So if you've got standing water, your soil is saturated and they're probably gonna drown. So there's, there's kind of multiple reasons. And even in areas where they're more abundant, we do find pockets of them. So, you know, you'll find when there are cicadas and trees, they lay like tons of eggs in those trees. And then, you know, five blocks away, there could be none in a tree. So you're not going to find them there. So there are different pockets. If you really want to see them and you happen to be in an area that doesn't, I would recommend downloading that cicada safari app. And then you can easily hunt to see where people have posted pictures of them. Great. Got one more comment from Melinda. She said, I have millions of them in my woodbine backyard. So I'm guessing I'm going to have to drive down to woodbine to see some of them. Yeah. So Melinda, definitely download that app and snap some pictures. Help some scientists like map out where these guys are. Great. Well, Emily, I want to thank you so much for your presentation and all of your knowledge. That was really awesome. Um, I don't see any more questions. So I think we can go ahead and wrap up this afternoon. Um, so thank you again so much. And for everybody watching, um, thank you for tuning in and enjoy the rest of this wonderful weekend. Get out there and go see the skaters. <laughs>